It's indeed my great pleasure to participate in this wonderful conference organized by Dr. Mayur and his team. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be talking on this interesting topic. All of us know the numbers of blood pressure are very important and crucial in the treatment of hypertension. And the World Hypertension Day 23 has rightly emphasized on accurate measurement of blood pressure and its control for living longer. The guidelines cover the number game with great precision and perfection in terms of diagnosis, initiation of treatment, and targets of blood pressure control. But beyond the number game, there are a panoply of facets which are important and of interest to a clinician. The first issue is that mortality in a controlled hypertensive is one and a half to two times compared to a normotensive, which means you are a hypertensive patient, you control your blood pressure, but when you control your blood pressure, your mortality does not come at par with a normotensive. So what are various reasons for this? There are several reasons, but two important reasons are highlighted on this slide. The first reason is even if your blood pressure is controlled, atherosclerotic complications continue to occur, which means you're a controlled hypertensive, you can still get myocardial infarction, you can still get stroke, and so on. The second reason is that fibrosis occurs in the various parts of the conduction system. In past, left ventricular hypertrophy was considered as synonymous with hypertensive heart disease, but Hypertensive heart disease is now much broadened, as you can see. Besides left ventricular hypertrophy, there is a component of atrial myopathy, and there's also a component of aortopathy, which was never present before. Fibrosis can be very easily delineated by LGE CMR, and if fibrosis occurs in different parts of the conduction system, it adversely affects prognosis. The other thing to remember is that antihypertensive agents decrease blood pressure related complications. It means if you are controlled hypertensive, there are less chances of left ventricular failure, less chances of uh, hemorrhagic stroke, and less chances of dissection, but they do not provide extra protection. Now this is a very interesting data from the HOPE 3 trial, which had an intermediate risk population. And these patients were treated with candesartan and hydrochlorothiazide, and you can see uh, when they were treated with uh, antihypertensive agent, uh, the primary endpoint, cardiovascular death, MI stroke, there was no change. But when 10 milligram rosuvastatin was added, you can see a 24% reduction in cardiovascular death, MI stroke, clearly indicating statins are beneficial even in the intermediate risk. And the escort LLA trial, if you remember 10 milligram at ROI in hypertensive with total cholesterol less than 250 after three years, decreased non-fetal MI and fetal CAT by 36%, which was significant. So we are talking of fibrosis. When fibrosis occurs in the myocardium, as you can see, as these white spots, the ventricle is more prone for development of heart failure. It is more prone for development of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, which means a hypertrophic and fibrotic ventricle has a worse prognosis compared to only a hypertensive or a hypertrophic ventricle. And this applies to ventricular hypertrophy from all causes, whether it's aortic stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or whatever it is. And in some of the centers for aortic valve surgery, 
uh, patients of aortic stenosis are routinely screened before surgery for any evidence of fibrosis. If fibrosis is present, uh, the results are less optimum even when the surgery is performed in an excellent way. The second component of hypertensive heart disease, which is now increasingly recognized, is left atrial fibrosis, as you can see in this. As fibrosis progresses, the patient becomes more prone for development of atrial fibrillation in a stroke. And some of the intelligent interventional cardiologists, when they perform RFA for atrial fibrillation, they always look at left atrial fibrosis because if the fibrosis advances in the left atrium, the probability of sustaining a sinus rhythm is remote despite a very good RFA procedure. So that is the importance of uh, left atrial fibrosis. Now fibrosis also occurs in larger arteries, what we termed as aortopathy as you can see. So if you see the aorta of a young individual, a compliant aorta, elastic tissue present, the normal pulsive velocity is 8 meters per second. So when the impulse travels in systems from the heart to the periphery, it comes back slowly, slowly, and by the time it reaches the heart, diastole has already set in, and this has several advantages. The coronary circulation is increased because of increase in the diastolic pressure. But when aortopathy is present, what will happen? The pulse wave velocity is increased. So but when the impulse traverses from the heart to the periphery, you can see it travels very fast. And by the time it reaches, systole is already ongoing and this produces several disadvantages. It can increase the aortic systolic pressure. It increases the LV afterload, the patient go in left ventricular failure. It is increases the pulsatile strain in the chances of plaque rupture, there's no diastolic augmentation and there's decreased coronary perfusion. The big issue is, is there any solution to minimize fibrosis? Very interesting data emerged from the long-term follow of the landmark ALHA trial. And what you can see, significant reduction in the conduction system disease with lisinopril compared to CTD or amlodipine after five years. The BP was higher in the lisinopril group and it seemed that the antifibrotic property of RAS inhibition could play a role, but uh, we like to have more data on this. So in hypertension, we should follow a disease-centric approach, which means you not only control your blood pressure around the clock, you also control your nocturnal blood pressure, the morning surges, the blood pressure variability, you also focus on small and large vessel remodeling. Remodeling of large arteries increases arterial stiffness, which you can measure by pulse wave velocity in aortic augmentation index, increased systolic blood pressure, increased pulse pressure, and increased atherosclerosis of large arteries produces ischemic stroke. Whereas remodeling of small arteries produces lacunar infarcts in the brain, cognitive decline, and so on. The second issue which I am going to touch is target heterogeneity. Now, Target heterogeneity means that you lower blood pressure in a hypertensive patient, do all target organs respond in a similar way? The answer is no. So let's see. When we talk of brain, lower systolic and diastolic is better. So lower is always better for the brain. And why do we say this is data from the famous ACCORD trial, which studied uh, 140 millimeter systolic blood pressure compared it to 140 millimeter systolic blood pressure. Uh, the trial was negative from the point of view of primary outcome, but when the stroke were individually analyzed, there was a significant decrease in stroke in the subset of patients with uh, 120 millimeter systolic blood pressure. Same data uh, from the inverse trial. As the blood pressure decreases, you can see diastolic blood pressure decreases, the decrease in the stroke. So lower systolic blood pressure, lower diastolic blood pressure is better for the brain. But when it comes to the heart, lower diastolic blood pressure is bad. Uh, this is data from the famous heart study. You can see the uh, brown bar are ischemic and the blue bars are non-ischemic. Ischemic events are more in the 
patients with low diastolic blood pressure, which is less than 80, less than 85, even less than 90. And this is again data from the Investral, which you see as the blood pressure decreases, the incidence of coronary events decreases. But when you further decrease the blood pressure to below 70, MI increases. So there is a J curve for the heart in hypertensive patient. And in most of the studies, the J-shaped curve was found to be at levels of diastolic blood pressure below 70 millimeters of mercury. And this also shows the relationship between diastolic blood pressure and elevated high sensitivity CTNT. Here you can see compared with the diastolic blood pressure of 80 to 89, diastolic blood pressure below 60 more than doubles the odds of high sensitivity cardiac troponin T levels equating or exceeding more than 14 nanograms, which increase the risk of incident coronary heart disease by about 50%. Another data in favor of J curve, uh, you can see the significance of J-curve in hypertensive and coronary artery disease. Interaction of the J-curve with coronary revascularization. The patients who are revascularized, they tolerate lower diastolic blood pressure better. The third issue which is often uh, talked about these days is increased sympathetic activity. Indians are hyperactive, they are hypersympathetic. And this is again data from the Indian study which shows that the prevalence of sympathetic overactivity in the newly diagnosed hypertensive patient is around about 62%. Another data from the Indian context, the BEAT uh, survey, which shows that, uh, again, increased sympathetic activity in the Indian population, and has seen that an increase in heart rate by 10 beats per minute is associated with 14% increase in single mortality and a 24% increase in total mortality in patients with hypertension. And this is the Indian heart study. All of us are aware of it. And this showed that the average resting heart rate was elevated around 80 millimeters, 80 beats per minute, both in the office uh, BP measurements and in the home BP measurements. And further, it is seen that in trials, even when your blood pressure is controlled, if your heart rate is higher, there are more chances of uh, cardiovascular events. So this is data from the famous value trial. <clears throat> you can see whether you are a controlled hypertensive, there's an increase in the incidence of cardiovascular, or even you are uncontrolled. So heart rate plays an important uh, contribution for development of cardiovascular events. Again, data from several other studies. This is data from the US study, you can see as the heart rate is increasing, there's increased all cause uh, death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal uh, stroke. This is again uh, data from the famous LIFE study. All cause mortality, CV mortality, they go on increasing as the heart rate increases. And same data is from the cis urine study, whether it's man or woman, all cause mortality progressively increases as the heart rate is increasing from 64 and so on. How sympathetic overactivity affects heart and hypertension, I'm not going to elude because of shortage of time. All of us are aware of it. But the big question is, which is unanswered, is that can we offer beta blocker in controlled hypertensive with increased resting heart rate, even in absence of CAD, HA for arrhythmia, despite lack of recommendation by Gulf? Uh, this is an unresolved issue as we do not have any trial to answer this question. But interestingly now, beta blockers have been uh, approved as first-line agents in the treatment of hypertension by the recent uh, European guidelines. The other issue which I'm going to touch upon is isolated systolic hypertension in young. We commonly see these days uh, those individuals who are working nighty or who are having night shift, their systolic blood pressure is elevated and unlike uh, Isolated systolic hypertension in elderly, which is an established entity, this is emerging as a new entity, and we've seen uh, beta blockers produce good response in these individuals, but this is still an evolving topic and more research is needed. Cognitive decline is again a very important issue in hypertension, and this is uh, the CARDIA study, which is a 25-year follow-up from the CAD risk development in the young adults. 
which recruited healthy adults aged 18 to 30 years at baseline long term bp variability over 25 years beginning in young adults was associated with cognitive impairment in middle life so one of the reasons why treatment of hypertension must be initiated very early is if you initiate treatment late you're likely to get cognitive decline which cannot be treated by any modality vascular age again is a very important issue and hypertension is a very important cause of premature vascular aging and these days we can calculate the vascular aging as you can see in these slides uh, you have to have a peripheral blood pressure a central blood pressure and the pulse wave velocity and the augmented index and the computer calculates so these are uh, uh, patients by which these are parameters by which we can have uh, the vascular age now this individual as you can see chronological age is 54 his vascular age is 57 uh, reasonably good but when we look at this individual his uh, chronological age is 37 vascular age is 46 bad and if you look at this individual chronological age is 54 but his vessels are 73 years old is very very bad the other issue which is uh, important these days is in the Indian context there's clustering of risk factors in hypertensive patients. You can see several risk factors, they cluster in hypertensive patients and we should take care of all these factors. And that's why we issue a health mobile number to our patients. As you can see on the screen, 130 80 is for systolic and diastolic blood pressure. 100 is for LDL, 7 is for HbA1c and 0 is for smoking. The other big issue which is often ignored by the physicians is the quality of life. The treatment of hypertension is a long drawn out process over the years are lifelong and therefore special emphasis should be laid on the quality of life. We should never forget life is not merely being alive but being well and sexual health is a very important integral part of total health. Total health cannot be achieved without sexual health. And our hypertensive patient should not only live, but also feel well. And in young hypertensive, when you are treating, use indapamide instead of HCTZ and CT, use nevaprolol in uh, place of uh, metoprolol and avoid centrally acting antihypertensive. Use ACEI, ARB or CCB to avoid erectile dysfunction. The other big problem is the dismal control rates of hypertension. Despite availability of a panoply of antihypertensive agents, the control rates are dismal. And uh, if you want to improve the control rates, uh, the, all the potential stroke orders in hypertension prevention must come into action. The medical fraternity alone can not improve the control rates. So non-government organization, government organizations, healthcare professionals, scientific organization, electronic and print media and social all have to come together if you want to improve the control rate which is very dismal but the big issue is even if you treat your hypertensive patients very well the number of hypertensive patients are progressively increasing in our country and therefore we want to stop hypertension stop hypertension and try to build hypertension free india and how can we do it this can be done by primordial prevention Primordial prevention means prevention of emergence of risk factors in populations in which they have not yet appeared by individuals and mass health education. And the best target for uh, this primordial prevention are these nursery kids. It is seen that uh, if the kids are taught regarding lifestyle modification, they continue to maintain in the later parts of the life, as shown by the familiar study data from uh, Dr. Valentine Foster. It is true that. Uh, Primordial build, uh, prevention will take several decades, but that is the only way you can uh, decrease the number of hypertensive patients. Otherwise, the number of hypertensive patients are progressively increasing. Thank you very much for your kind attention.